So Merry Christmas. Uh, Yes, we've been talking about awaiting Advent. If you've been with us, Advent is a distinctively Christian term. Uh, It has a Latin uh, etymology. It means arrival. It means coming. We say Advent. Uh, Yes, we say Christmas. Uh, But Christmas, for so many, has now really been devoid of meaning for a lot of people. Uh, You might be out in a mall or at a coffee shop or somewhere, and you'll hear, you know, carols over the the sound system being played or songs that are, that are, and I, I'll be sitting there uh, and I'm thinking or, 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 or listening that they're singing about my savior. That song is about Jesus. And then I wonder how many are we picking up on this? Like, do you know what we're singing about here? I often wonder with those who don't know Christ or don't understand the meaning of Christmas, are these just traditional songs and there's something about Jesus, we, we get that. But it seems like through the years that we've lost the meaning of Christmas and, and now there's the culture war of Merry Christmas up against Happy Holidays and all of those things. I, I was um, probably in sixth grade or so when a friend uh, uh, of mine and I decided that we're gonna bring Christ back to Christmas. This is your pastor. This is a true story. I am I'm with him. We get, we get poster boards. Out and we get markers and we write, put Christ back in Xmas. <laughs> because I saw that people have been saying Xmas and seen signs about Xmas. I'm literally, I'm like in middle school, I'm in all of my middle school angst and raging against secularism in the world. We went, took these signs to, <laughs> I was a weird kid. We went to the shopping mall near my house and put and taped them on the windows and we my mom's probably listening to this message she's like I didn't know you did that you know we we went out there we put signs up that said bring Christ back to Xmas and went home satisfied now kids don't do that yeah you don't it's probably an ordinance probably against the law don't do that um but I my point is this well, well, then, how about this? I, I, I then learned to go to seminary. Chi, right, is the first letter in the word Christos in the Greek, which can represent, now who knows that though, right? It, which can be X, can represent Christ. So maybe we weren't so far off there, but the challenge is not, can I say it? It's not, let's keep Christ in Christmas. The challenge is, let's keep Christ in Christians. Let's live with the power of his spirit in us so that others might see Christ. That's the problem. That might see Christ in his children, his disciples, his followers. They're drawn to him. Then yes, they can join us in the celebration because then they know what it means. Advent is for us to really reenact the long-awaited savior, the waiting, the anticipation. Our children do it well often impatiently, but they are so excited about Christmas Day. We can learn from them. We too can be excited about the coming Savior, the fact that yes, he has come. And yes, he's coming again. This is what Advent is all about. And so I hope, just a little plug here, listen, if you don't have the Advent Guide, we went to great lengths to put this together for you as a church family. So the idea was, Instead of just gathering on Sundays, glorious and wonderful, let's every day as a church family march together by focusing in on his word. This is mine. Uh, And I've been walking through it every day, taking notes, writing down prayers. They're available on your way out at different spots. Don't leave until you have one and you can join this movement of God as we too learn to grow in our waiting. See, Christian waiting, we've said, is not passive. It's active waiting. And we've said that, that we've, we, we focused on awaiting his promise, awaiting his rescue. And today, I want to talk about awaiting his presence. A lot of times we're waiting for the presence of someone to show up. There's some kids maybe waiting on parents to come pick them up in a bit. There's parents who wait for children. Uh, how about... Um, a pregnant mom, a father, they wait for the baby to come. We wait for friends to come at Christmas time. Often we're waiting for the presence of someone to show up. 
Christmas means that Christ has come. The presence of God has come to us. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay this out. Lots of theology, lots of scripture today. If you've heard me preach much, this is a different kind of sermon. I'm gonna say up front. Uh, we're gonna walk through, I, I'm gonna daunting task the Lord's given me. I wanna walk through a history of the presence of God in scripture. And I want you to see, first of all, we might think, well, isn't God omnipresent? Like, isn't he everywhere? Yes, He's on the backside of Jupiter right now, on the backside of the moon. He's at the depths of the ocean. He's at the top of Mount Everest. He sees everything from the molecular level all to, throughout the cosmos. But he manifests his presence as well. We know that he shows up bringing his presence in special ways and special places. We'll, we'll talk today about how he indwells, he, the indwelling presence of the spirit in every believer. We also see that he, people are filled with the Spirit. We see that in Scripture, right? Filled with the Spirit. Paul does this. Filled with the Spirit. Uh, Peter says this. And most often, filled with the Spirit for a particular task. But here's the thing. Every believer is to be filled with the Spirit of God. What does this mean? It means that we have a conscious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ Letting his mind through his word give us thoughts and then guide every action of our lives. We seek to live as spirit filled believers. Let me remind you today if you've received Christ, you've received the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You enter into a Trinitarian dance. It's a mystery. We step into this triune relationship. He now indwells us, our spirit. He fills us with his spirit. Friend, today, if you're a believer, listen, be reminded. Key application of this message. You have the very presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And the first is to acknowledge this. Now, in order to get us to where I want us to go today, what I think the Lord has for us, I'm excited about this. So you have to put on your thinking caps, okay? And I think I've got a graduate group here who can go with me with some theology, with some history, okay? But I'm gonna be touching on a lot of scripture. You can go there with me if you want to. Uh, try to follow along, but uh, we're gonna move kind of fast and I'm excited about this. It's an unusual sermon. First of all, I want you to see, we'll go back to the beginning. How about that? You can go to Genesis chapter one. This is where it starts. Chapter one, verse one, especially verse two. What we see in, in creation is the spirit is called throughout the Old Testament, Ruach. Everybody say Ruach. All right, now to do it correctly, you have to clear your throat on the back end of that, but we'll save one another from that. Ruach is the invisible presence, the energy of God. Now do this, take a deep breath, in and out. When you breathe in, that's Ruach, the word, same word, breath. Wind, same word. Is translated ruach throughout the Old Testament. But here's the thing. You also, as you breathe, praise be to God, we can breathe. You feel the energy of life. That's ruach. Ruach is the energy, the spirit, the life of God in each one of us. Chapter 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. Here it is. And the spirit, ruach of God, was hovering over the face of the waters. If we went on into Genesis 2, you know, then we see flowers and trees. Animals come along. Adam and Eve are given breath and life. In fact, the ruach is the source of life we see throughout Genesis. And it's still the case. In fact, ruach, God's ruach, is the creative energy the creative spirit of God that brings ruach to all non-divine ruach breathing animals and humans. All of life is breathed forth and given life because of God. You and I breathe today because God has breathed life into us. He keeps us alive even still. So the very location, I want you to see this, of the presence of God manifest was in the garden. With Adam and Eve, they could walk with him. They had perfect communion, relationship with him. Now, as we've been drawing from the prophets, 
We, we focused in on Isaiah in particular, 700 years before Christ. Last week we looked at um, Isaiah 53. If you were here with us, where Christ was afflicted, the suffering servant took on our infirmities, took on our sin, our punishment. He took on the symptoms of the disease, like leprosy, even worse, not the disease itself. He lived the perfect life, but he took our symptoms. He took it all upon himself, afflicted with our disease of sin. And then with amazing accuracy, if you were with us, you know Isaiah 53, he described what took place on the cross. Today from Isaiah 7, I'm gonna launch from a single verse. Isaiah 7, 14, it says this. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means what? God with us. God's presence in the person of Jesus. Let's talk about awaiting his presence. You've already heard it sung. We've, we've, we've heard it spoken already. There's an ongoing dynamic to biblical prophecy. And when you look at Isaiah, like we have here of late, there's the, the miraculous um, dynamic of biblical prophecy is that it can mean something in the present to the first hearers. Not always, but often. And it can also at the same time be fulfilled more completely in the future. And this is what we see throughout Isaiah. In fact, you'll be reading Isaiah and he said, wait, is he talking about Christ's coming? Like the first advent? Or is he talking about like new creation? When he comes again and then into eternity, yes. And yes, he talks about both and often will shift from one to another. Here he's talking about the coming of Christ. So I want to take a kind of history again through, as we look at the presence of God coming to us. I've mentioned the Garden of Eden, the presence of God in creation, walking with Adam and Eve. But the the progression I want to look at goes like this. We see him in the garden. I want to talk about his presence comes in the temple. Okay, it comes in the tabernacle, which supersedes the temple in design and purpose, same. Temple's a larger version of the tabernacle. I want to talk through this. This is where you're going to have to hang with me. And then I want to talk about his presence comes in Jesus and his presence comes in us. Now, the temple was a larger replica of the, of the tabernacle. I want you to just really focus in here. The Israelites had the tabernacle for 440 years up until David who brought it to Jerusalem. And his son, whose name was Solomon, builds the temple. It takes seven years to build on uh, the, which now under the Dome of the Rock. Has anyone ever been there? Have you ever been to see this? I've seen this. The temple is there and it's right there on a hill, Mount Moriah. It's on a hill and it's right there. I've I've shown you how his presence is in the Garden of Eden. And I want you to see a, a progression here. The tabernacle supersedes the temple as the dwelling place of God. If you wanted to go back to Exodus 25 through 31, Exodus 35 through 40, you can see exactly how the tabernacle is designed. Sometimes you read that and you go, what is the, wow, like why all the details? I'll show you a bit of that today. The tabernacle was, was where God's presence, catch this, the very location of the presence of God was in the tabernacle. You know that it had an outer court. It had an inner court. It had the holy of holies where God's presence resided for almost 400 years. Then the temple was the crown jewel and center of Israel's worship. Almost half the Old Testament was written while the temple was standing. Uh, During, after Solomon again, uh, built the temple in about 960 BC. David was about 1000 BC, comes to Jerusalem, names it the capital, brings the tabernacle there and the tabernacle again, a prototype of the temple and watch this, a prototype of the Garden of Eden. Eden was located on a hill. Tree of life is right at the center. Tree of knowledge of good and evil located at the center of the garden when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden east of Eden. The cherubim and a flaming sword were there placed at the entrance of the garden. They could not go back to eat from the tree of life. They're exiled from the garden. They would have to retrace their steps symbolically back to the garden from east to west, that would be east 
to west. God commanded the tabernacle was to be set up from east to west. A progression from the east into the west. Three courts, the outer court, the inner court representing really the outer court, the fallen world, the inner court representing a more holy way of life, the holy of holies where the very presence of God resided. A priest who represented all of Israel. Are you with me? He walks, progressed from east to west. He would move closer and closer to the presence of God. As the priest would come into the tabernacle, later the temple, he would pass by the cherubim to go into the holy place. The temple was designed in the same way, much larger. Outside the temple, there were animal sacrifices that were made. There were basins of water. This is a place where the, the priest would, would go through rituals of cleansing before he could ever step into the inner, uh, inner court, which was, had this gold overlay. He would go in and eat the showbread that was eaten one time on the Sabbath, not in the Holy of Holies. He went there only one time of the year. Anybody know what day that was? The day of atonement, graduate level. Good job. We call it today Yom Kippur. Okay, so only one day out of the year, but he could go into this holy place, the the inner court, so the people could enter vicariously through the priest the high priest, and in this area, the inner court, it was overlaid with gold and there were images of flowers, pomegranates, palm trees, reflecting, superseded by the the, the Garden of Eden. Incense is burning before the giant veil and the high priest could enter in the Holy of Holies, again, one time a year, and he'd pass through the veil He would pass by the angels that are guarding the veil like the cherubim guarding the inner garden of Eden, the Holy of Holies. It was 20 cubits wide, 20 cubits high. It was a perfect square by the time he got through this rectangle into the Holy of Holies. And as the high priest walked in, he would see two large cherubim covering the Ark of Covenant and and, and stretching across the whole room. The Holy of Holies represented the very place, the very location of the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. See, see, the layout of the temple was designed to show the progression that was necessary for a priest representing them all to enter into, to walk into the very presence of God and to have a right relationship with him. In fact, to go in and to eat the showbread. What a strange thing. He would go in and eat because what it meant was he had relationship. You were at peace with a person and he partake of the showbread. Not unlike we partake of the Lord's Supper, the new covenant. Now we enter in to that covenant and celebrate the progression that we're able to have and a right relationship with God. The whole point of the temple was this is where the presence of God resides. Now in Genesis, God's presence fills all of creation. Yes, manifest in the, in the garden. But after seven days, his spirit fills all things. He brings life to all things and then he It says that he would then rest and proclaim it all good. Took seven years to build the temple and in the Sabbath, a series of seven days, the priest could go in and rest before God, even eat with him in right relationship because of of all that he's walked through and, and all that God has done. So Adam and Eve created in God's image, they are to be royal priests. Think about this. They are to care for his good creation. They end up wanting to rule on their own. The people of Israel are called to be a nation of priests. They too decide to rule on their own. They too turn from God, enter Isaiah among other prophets. Who comes and he says, listen, if you don't repent, if you don't turn to God, then God's judgment is going to come upon you. It is going to come in the form of Assyria from the north. Then it's going to be Babylon who are going to take you out. And sure enough, in 586 BC, right as Isaiah is prophesying, just after that, Assyria comes in, Babylon comes in, destroys the temple, the center of worship. The place that represents the very presence of God destroyed, wiped out what's going to happen. 
The people are exiled. They're sent out for 70 years. And then the second temple is built by whom leading the way? Nehemiah builds the second temple and it lasts for 585 years until the Romans come in after a really an uh, retaliation of an ongoing Jewish revolt, destroy the second temple. Anybody know the date of that one? 70 BC. Just all of this history, just prior to Christ's coming, there is no temple. What are the people to do? What will God do? All of creation watches to see. His presence comes in the temple. Now we see his presence comes in Jesus. God comes to us in the person of Jesus. This is the incarnation. He ushers in a completely new creation, what we call the kingdom of God. He comes not simply to show us who God is, yes, that he exists and what he's like. He's come to usher in an entirely new creation, the kingdom of God. The story of Christmas is the story of how God became king. This is a paradigm shift for a lot of us. Christianity is not us trying to get, you know, work harder, get better, get smart enough to come to God. It's God coming to us. And a lot of us understand that. But think about this. It's not about going somewhere else. It's about the kingdom of God coming to us. Jesus shows up and he says, I want you to pray this way. First of all, the, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom has arrived. I'm preaching the kingdom of God. What does this mean? Anywhere he rules and reigns is the kingdom of God. Think of it that way. It's not a place. It's wherever he rules and reigns. He calls us to pray for his will to be done, his kingdom to come on what? On earth as it is in heaven on earth not simply in heaven Isaiah 11 again shows us this dynamic prophecy nature of prophecy where he says there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and branch from his root shall bear fruit the, the, the uh, Messiah to come and look, look at what it says and the spirit Ruach here we go of the Lord shall rest upon him the ruach of wisdom and understanding the ruach of counsel and might the ruach of knowledge and the fear of the Lord the ruach the very presence of God is upon Jesus the Messiah and then in in, uh, Isaiah 42 verse 1 behold my servant who I have hold my chosen one in whom my soul delights I have put my spirit my ruach upon him He'll bring forth justice to all the nations. Now the very location of the presence of God is in the person of Jesus. Which is why John, watch this, the beginning of John, chapter 1, sounds like Genesis. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And he was in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing, uh, not anything made. It was made. In him was life. And the light, can I say it? The Ruach was the light of men. Light shines over the darkness just as the darkness was covered uh, and then brought forth in, with light in Genesis. Jesus shows up bringing a new creation in chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and, can I, do you know it? Tabernacled among us. Literally tabernacles among us comes to us. I love what the message says. He moved into the neighborhood. The very presence of God. As our choir sang earlier, John 1 18, he goes on. No eye has seen him and yet Jesus has revealed him. He has made him known to us. The entire Bible is heaven and earth being united. Again, it's not us going somewhere. It's not somewhere you go. It's the rule and reign of Christ in us. Jesus comes bringing the kingdom. Not somewhere we go, but something that's arrived. And as we live filled with the Spirit, when we show up, we're not much, but the kingdom arrives. Because Christ is in us. Jesus comes. He doesn't stay in the temple. He goes out. He's running about. Now little pockets of heaven are showing up everywhere. The kingdom of heaven shows up out there. 
And he calls us to do the same. His presence comes in the temple. His presence comes in Jesus. And I'll close with this. His presence comes in us. The very location of the presence of God is now in us. It's why Jesus would say in John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. And the disciples are going, what? Because if I don't go, the helper will not come. My presence will go and watch this. My spirit, the very presence, spirit of Jesus will come, convict the world concerning sin and righteousness, will fill us, those of us who, who have received his grace. And as Jesus said his presence, his rest, his rule would be in us. Then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter six, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your spirit, his spirit resides in us. You're not your own. Bought with a price. Therefore glorify God through your body. Remember that the spirit of God is in you. Closer than your own skin. Nearer than your own heartbeat. Friend, do you know him? Have you received Christ as your Lord? If not, the spirit of God is not in you. You can't discern or have power over sin in your life. And God is calling you to him today. He's calling you into his church. It's by his word, again, that we hear his spirit speak to us, points us to his son. We have power over sin in our lives as his spirit fills us. It's why Paul said, here's why this is so critical. The only way you can face the battles of this world are by being filled with the spirit of God. Paul describes the Christian life in the book of Ephesians in a single word, struggle. Anybody? It is a struggle. And he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the dark forces and principalities of this world. We live in occupied space. Don't forget that. As you go out into this world, as you enter into relationships, as you wrestle, struggle with the challenges of your life, remember that you're facing demonic forces but the spirit of God lives in you and he gives you power over those things. This new creation is being ushered in even now through our lives. Let's keep Christ in us. First Peter two, verse five, it says you yourselves like living stones are being built up spiritual house to be a, look at this, holy priesthood. Holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. His presence comes through the temple. His presence comes through Jesus. In Jesus, his presence comes in us. And then we go to all the way to Revelation 21. I'll close with this. John says, I, I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. Where's the temple? All of creation, all of new creation is the temple of God. Everything is filled with the glory of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 19, he says it this way, they will neither, uh, neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain." For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk says the same. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In heaven, in the new creation, there's a tree. There's no temple because now the presence of God is there with us. Friends, we're going to see him face to face. All of history is heading to Jesus' prayer being fulfilled. Heaven come to earth as we live on resurrected earth, worshiping a resurrected Savior in our resurrected bodies. His presence comes by way of his spirit and lives in every one of us who follow him as Lord. Don't forget that this week as you live for him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this journey through uh, your presence. There's so much more to say, but we thank you for how all of history comes together as we look at your word. It all makes sense. And our lives make sense in light of it all. 
I pray for those who don't know you here today or listening to my voice that they would receive your grace now. Thank you for dying on the cross or being that sacrifice that allowed us to go through and to be in your presence. You tore the veil so that we could walk into your presence and have a relationship with you, eat with you, dine with you, have fellowship with you. We thank you for that, Lord. We live in that truth today. May we be filled with your spirit as we live our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Praise be to God.